Welcome to the Radiology Review Podcast, your on-the-go source for radiology education with your host, Dr. Matt Covington, a board-certified radiologist. Please follow the podcast on Twitter at RadRevPodcast. Send emails to theradiologyreview at gmail.com or visit the website theradiologyreview.com. On this episode... I'm going to talk about a topic that was requested by one of my listeners in Australia, and she sent me a very nice email and asked that I discuss neurofibromatosis because this is a highly tested topic for the board examinations in Australia. And I really appreciated this suggestion because I couldn't agree more that neurofibromatosis is important for radiology board examinations. In fact, there is enough information on neurofibromatosis alone for two episodes, so I will talk about neurofibromatosis on this episode, and then we will learn more about it on the subsequent episode. So I want to thank again this listener for writing in and encourage you also that if there is a topic you think would be beneficial to discuss, please let me know. So let's get into it. Neurofibromatosis is a phacomatosis, and that is P-H-A-K-O-M-A-T-O-S-I-S, and the phacomatoses are neurocutaneous disorders that involve the ectoderm and involve the central nervous system and other tissues like skin. Other diseases that you certainly know about that are also phacomatoses include tuberous sclerosis, von Hippel-Lindau syndrome, Sturgey-Weber syndrome, neurofibromatosis 1 and 2, and there are actually other types of neurofibromatosis, but the ones we focus on are NF1 and NF2, and all of these are very commonly tested, and all of these are also relatively common diseases. All of these also have very compelling imaging manifestations, and the radiologist can really be useful in clinching the diagnosis for these diseases and evaluating for tumor formation and other things that are associated with many of these. Neurofibromatosis type 1 is the most common phacomatosis, and hence it is probably the most commonly tested. It is an autosomal dominant inheritance pattern in many but not all cases. The NF1 gene is located on chromosome 17, Q11.2, and for bird purposes, just try to remember 17. I'm not exactly sure why it's important for radiologists to know which chromosome this is on, but it is something that I think you should know because it can show up. And it's just one of those things that if you know it and they ask it, it's a really easy question. So NF1, chromosome 17. And this chromosome abnormality is something that causes a tumor suppressor of the RAS MAP kinase pathway to not work correctly. A random fact is that NF1 is also sometimes called von Recklinghausen disease, and von Recklinghausen has 17 letters, and I suppose that can help you remember that NF1 is on chromosome 17Q. I do think it's kind of interesting that someone figured that out. I'm not sure in reality if you want to be counting letters when you take a board exam to see if it happens to be 17, but it is interesting. Von Recklinghausen disease, NF1, 17 letters, chromosome 17. The diagnosis of NF1 is something that I suspect most of you learned about in medical school. It's kind of a step one type question, but it also is very pertinent for the radiology board exams. So to be diagnosed with NF1, you need two or more of the following. The first is that at least two neurofibromas or one plexiform neurofibroma must be present. And a plexiform neurofibroma is a benign peripheral nerve tumor. And although benign, these plexiform neurofibromas carry a risk of malignant transformation, which is unlike a garden variety cutaneous neurofibroma. Plexiform neurofibromas involve nerve roots and a nerve plexus, but it is overall challenging to distinguish these from other neurofibromas. And what we're looking for are larger lesions or lesions that are growing more rapidly, and those are the ones that may be excised due to concern about malignancy. So if there is a particularly large and fusiform lesion with rapid growth, think malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor, and that is what we are worried about in neurofibromatosis patients and want to detect as early as possible, and the treatment for that is often excision. 
having at least two neurofibromas or one plexiform neurofibroma will give you one point in terms of clinching a diagnosis of neurofibromatosis, but that alone is not enough because you need two or more of these. Also on the list is an optic nerve glioma, something very important to remember for this. Also greater than six cafe au lait spots that develop in one year. Also axillary and inguinal freckling, which is sometimes called intertriginous freckling. That's I-N-T-E-R-T-R-I-G-I-N-O-S, intertriginous freckles. Also some form of osseous involvement, which often involves sphenoid wing dysplasia and pseudoarthrosis. Also two or more iris hamartomas, those are what are called Lisch nodules. Also a first degree relative with NF1. And that rounds out the list I would remember. You need two or more of at least two neurofibromas or one plexiform neurofibroma, optic nerve glioma greater than six cafe au lait spots developing in one year, axillary and inguinal freckling, osseous involvement, two or more iris hamartomas or Lisch nodules, or a first degree relative with NF1. And for this and other phacomatoses, for first-degree relatives of patients with NF1, you often do some sort of screening, whether it be genetic testing or imaging, because the risk is so high if you have a first-degree relative with these diseases and you don't want to go without detecting these because of the cancer associations. There is an acronym that may help you remember this. It's CAFE SPOT, C-A-F-E-S-P-O-T. And obviously the C is for cafe au lait spots, A, axillary freckling, F, fibromas, E, eye hamartomas, S, skeletal abnormalities, P, positive family history, O, optic nerve tumors, and O, T, optic nerve tumors. Okay, O for optic, T for tumors, cafe spot. That's one of the better acronyms. I generally am not a huge fan of these. They don't work so well for me, but I know they do work for a lot of people. So CAFE SPOT acronym NF1. A few additional points. NF1 often presents earlier with clinical manifestations than NF2. There are many possible associated tumors that NF1 patients can get. The main one to remember is malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumors. And about 50% of malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumors will arise in patients with NF1, but also renal angiomyolipomas, many different varieties of gliomas, not just the optic nerve glioma, and other things like pheochromosatoma Wilms tumor and many more. So remember, this is an abnormality of a tumor suppressor gene, so not surprising that you can find tumor development in these patients. Neurofibroma involvement may be localized to the cutaneous tissues or diffuse, and when the neurofibromas are diffuse, the external appearance is memorable and striking, and I think you all know what that can look like. Also remember that these neurofibromas can involve the cutaneous and subcutaneous tissues of the breast, and a mammogram in a patient with multiple neurofibromas is really an ant mini and is something that breast imaging tends to ask. So if you don't know what neurofibromas on a mammogram look like, you need to look that up because it's an ant mini. They can simply show you the image and you would be expected to say neurofibromatosis because nothing else really looks like it on a mammogram. Remember that NF1 can involve the vascular system, so you can have things like arteriovenous malformations, aneurysms, renal artery stenosis, and coarctation of the aorta, So they can ask you different things like hypertension in a young child or teenager and show you renal artery stenosis and you would be expected to clue in that this isn't normal in a young person so you would think NF1 or they could show you an intracranial aneurysm and maybe give you additional history like axillary freckling and you would be expected to piece this together for NF1. The treatment is surgical resection of tumors and otherwise supportive therapy. Let's now move on to some of the basics of NF2. A key point with NF2 is that it is not really associated with neurofibromas. You can have very mild manifestations of neurofibromas, but generally that's not a major feature with this. So the name is kind of a misnomer. NF1 and NF2 both have autosomal dominant inheritance. 
and the NF2 gene is on chromosome 22Q12. And thankfully, chromosome 22 has two twos in it, and that can help you remember NF2, chromosome 22. NF1 is chromosome 17, NF2, chromosome 22. NF2 is really a central nervous system predominant disease. And with NF2, you see schwannomas, and most commonly they will be vestibular schwannomas, and often they will be bilateral vestibular schwannomas. So with NF2, there's lots of twos. Okay, chromosome 22, and I remember two vestibular schwannomas because they'll often show you images that show bilateral vestibular schwannomas, and that's kind of an ant mini for NF2. With NF2, it's CNS predominant, like I said, and beyond schwannomas, you can also have CNS meningiomas, and you can also have intramedullary spinal ependymomas. And there's an acronym for this, and this acronym works quite well if you can remember it. I think the CAFE spot is better for NF1 in that it actually is memorable for NF1 because of the CAFE LA spots. The acronym for NF2 is miss me and that's m-i-s-m-e and what i don't like about this acronym is it's just hard for me to remember you know miss me doesn't scream nf2 but it stands for multiple inherited schwannomas meningiomas and ependymomas to break that down m multiple i inherited s schwannomas m meningiomas and e ependymomas miss me and if you remember that, it will clue you into what you expect to see on imaging, which is multiple inherited schwannomas, meningiomas, and ependymomas. And if that's helpful for you, go ahead and remember that acronym, Miss Me. If you see a meningioma in a child, you should automatically consider NF2. Also, if you see bilateral vestibular schwannomas, you should also consider NF2. Here are some tips on how I remember some of these facts. NF1, I remember that one. And I think, what is the one thing that you most commonly think of with neurofibromatosis? And for me, that is neurofibromas. So NF1 is the one that has prominent features of neurofibromas. If they show you a neurofibroma on a question, I automatically assume this will be NF1. Also, I think the O in 1 for optic or orbit, and that helps me remember that NF1 is the one with orbital or optic nerve gliomas. NF2 has the 2, and I think of that 2 meaning bilateral, and that clues me into vestibular schwannomas. I also remember NF2 is associated with chromosome 22, and I also remember that NF1 is more likely to present in the first decade of life. Okay, 1 first, and NF2 is more likely to present later, such as in the second decade of life. Everyone learns differently. Those one and two features help me remember some of the differences between NF1 and NF2. If that's helpful for you, go ahead and pack that away in your brain. That's a fairly dense review of NF1 and NF2, so I'm going to end it here. We will learn more about neurofibromatosis on the next episode, including things to specifically look for on images they may show you on a board exam for both of these entities. I hope this is helpful for you. I appreciate the positive feedback that I continue to receive from you, and I wish you much success with your studying and learning. I'll catch you on the next episode. Content of this podcast is provided for informal educational purposes only for radiology trainees and radiologists. Medical practitioners, please make your own independent assessment before suggesting a diagnosis or recommending any course of treatment. This podcast should not be used for self-diagnosis or self-treatment and is not a substitute for independent professional medical care. Please consult your own physician regarding any diagnosis, imaging interpretation, or course of treatment.